Hello, welcome along to Live On Air tonight. Uh, I'm David Bell from Kiwi Connection and uh, the Trinity at Waiaki Learning Centre. And I've got with me, sitting next to me, Max Thompson, who's a member of the congregation at Trinity at Waiaki. But most important of all, we've got over in Perth in Australia, uh, Demi, and Demi uh, Nakoff is going to tell us a lot about himself and uh, his movies, uh, his experience and things like uh, thinking about virtual realities and all of this kind of thing. It's going to be a very free-flowing conversation. Uh, but without any further ado, uh, Demi, uh, let's put it over to you. Tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, hi, David. Um, uh, very, very glad to, to, to be here. And um, I'm, uh, I'm basically... Uh, um, a filmmaker, a director, content maker that uh, uh, kind of fascinated uh, a little bit uh, with uh, science fiction and uh, quite lately with uh, virtual reality and uh, augmented reality. And uh, um, I've been uh, kind of interested in making movies for quite a while. So um, really glad to, to be here today and um, hopefully, you know, uh, we can we can uh, make it quite interesting for your viewers, and uh, maybe I learned something a little bit more about VR and AR from from them uh, because I don't claim to be an expert. I'm just an enthusiast. Righty ho! Well, believe it or not, we've got Stuart McAdam from uh, CEO of Cinema Addicts is already in here, and he's put a question up. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to select that question yet, Stuart, because we need to do some other things. But first of all, Demi, you've made a number of movies. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about the movies that you've made? Um, I've made a, a couple of shorts. Uh, one of them, um, I, first, the first one I made was uh, at a film school. Um, was called um, For Alan, which was uh, a short documentary about um, uh, um, a very talented young man uh, suffering from muscular dystrophy. And uh, that was my first uh, uh, short film. Um, then I made a couple of other short films, which uh, basically no budget, uh, short on weekends. One of them was a crime drama called uh, um, blind side. Uh, it was about um, uh, family violence uh, in a kind of middle class New Zealand home that happens behind uh, closed doors. So um, that that and um, then we made uh, another short called uh, Playmates, which was uh, a crime thriller about uh, a deranged uh, psychopath who goes in a cafe and tortures and kills everybody. <laughs> so some of your really are dark. quite dark, really, aren't they? Yeah. they? They explore different aspects of the human yeah. personality. But there's uh, particularly the documentary, uh, the documentary about the man that climbed the equivalent of Everest. Tell us about that one, Demi. Oh, uh, Malcolm Lowe. Um, Malcolm Locke, he's a, a, a remarkable man. I, I met in uh, 2010, I, I believe. Um, he wanted to do, back then, before uh, uh, doing Everest in a day, um, in 2013, uh, uh, he initially uh, wanted to end it uh, to run the seven great walks of New Zealand in seven days, which is 361 kilometers in seven days uh, on both islands. And um, I kind of volunteered to make a documentary about that and uh, be with him all the way through the uh, through his journey and made like 14, 15 minute documentary. Uh, he was raising money for Leukemia and Blood Foundation because his brother uh, died from leukemia when he was eight or nine, I believe. Or, uh, and um, he wanted to inspire people basically just to be healthy, to um, to um, help uh, Leukemia and Blood Foundation uh, with uh, their um, support of uh, that uh, um, very difficult disease. And um, then in 2013, he did um, a similar uh, attempt. And that was actually preparation for a bigger run uh, somewhere in the UK. 
something like coastal walk or some, something like that. I'm not quite sure, but he did that uh, Everest in a day on um, uh, in Auckland uh, to um, raise money and ho help uh, mental health uh, uh, foundation in New Zealand uh, because his uh, uh, another relative uh, of, uh, his, his um, uh, passed away because of that. So um, it's really, it's really, uh, he takes um, really uh, huge tasks on and his body, I don't know how he handles it and uh, to help others and that that's what I find kind of really remarkable and inspiring that uh, you know we as a human beings we are very resilient and we're built to withstand quite a quite a bit of a hammering not only from life but uh, <laughs> from each other I guess so yeah that was quite so a, I think some of what comes out in that documentary is the resilience of human yeah. nature and yeah. the thing that I've started to understand just a little bit is I've explored um, what you do in filmmaking uh, and all the, all the sort of different things that go on with filmmaking. You've got a huge interest in what I'd call the human condition. Uh, it <laughs> explores all kinds of things. And I'm just fascinated by the fact that in all of these films that you make, you're able to to draw on um, that sense of resilience. Does that come from your background at all? Uh, I mean, whereabouts have you come from in life to end up in Perth? <laughs> um, well, I'm born in Sofia uh, in Bulgaria um, in 1979. Uh, and... Um, I guess it's it's um, it's a country that uh, has quite a quite a rich history with uh, uh, surviving uh, quite a bit. Uh, uh, we've been uh, we've been country that has been taken over by quite a few either kingdoms or re regimes or something. And the most recent kind of one, which is quite a quite a few hundred years back, <laughs> uh, that's uh, the Ottoman Empire. We used to be under 500 years uh, under the uh, Ottoman Empire, uh, Turkish rule, uh, which uh, I guess uh, during, during those times there was uh, a lot of um, uh, atrocities happening. So uh, I don't say that that kind of transcends into why I'm doing what I'm doing is, I guess just being in a few countries after leaving Bulgaria in 91 and then going to uh, Macedonia for a few years, then going to Czech Republic for a few years and then coming to New Zealand uh, since 2002 until 2014, now uh, moving to, to Perth, Australia, just being in a few countries and starting over from from scratch, it kind of teaches you to appreciate that kind of resilience, that kind of a mentality that you can start from scratch, build yourself up, you fall down, then you pick yourself up, and it comes back. That's why probably I'm doing uh, films because it's quite a difficult industry. There's a lot of knockbacks uh, on my ass all the time, uh, and everybody who is involved uh, experiences that. So the movies I make, it has to do with that. Even if I didn't realize it until now, you mentioned it. That is that resilience of human condition. It's kind of transcends into all my films. Even if my forefront, my my conscious mind was striving for something else that kind of resilience and kind of being able to pick yourself up and and move forward it goes through all the films so yeah that's a really interesting point <laughs> well, well one of the things that also has struck me because as i've prepared for this interview uh has been denny's uh, absolute mastery of the world of social media uh, <laughs> And you'll see I've prepared a special page on Kiwi Connection. I've actually made it a public page. Uh, and our viewers that belong to Kiwi Connection can get into it and, and look at all, all your social media activities. But there's mm. such a range of things where you seem to be wanting, through the medium of 
uh, whether it's filmmaking or d just ecological awareness, that kind of thing. Max, yeah. you, you've got an engineering interest in all things ecological. Um, Dimi put up a movie, uh, not his, but a, a, a brilliant movie of a container <laughs> just placed in a particular place and someone pushed a button and the container literally unfolded itself into a house. And if you're talking about social housing, uh, you know, I think you should go and watch, uh, you know, just follow Dimi Nakov on, on Facebook <laughs> because the number of times that, it, you know, this is feeding your ability to make film. And there's no question that you're a talented filmmaker, um, Thank you. but you're also up against the fact that in industry, the movie industry, you're mm. very, very um, minor compared to those big corporations. And how do you feel about that as a filmmaker? Um, how, how do you find your niche as a filmmaker? Well, um, I... I see it as a individual and as a person that uh, we all start from zero. I don't see a single one of us was born with a camera in our hand and the ability to edit and tell stories. We all started from zero. And and uh, when I look at myself, I see, I see my path behind me as a way of learning what I've done and what I've seen and what I've been exposed to and try to move forward to whatever the path in front of me it's going to lead. So I don't want to compare myself with a, a big corporation or a big filmmaker or a small filmmaker or a smarter filmmaker or a more talented filmmaker. I try to learn from them because the only way to actually stay sane and not not completely crack because of that comparison is so big uh, is to basically try, try to learn from them and be myself, try to find my own path and my own style, which I'm to a certain extent still trying to figure out. Uh, I know in a certain directions I want to go and want to do certain things, but not necessarily that's going to dictate where I'm going to end up. Until So, yeah, I, hopefully it kind of answers your question. Well, it does, and it, it also opens up an, another question that I think <laughs> is... <laughs> that, that part of your filmmaking is very much about uh, science fiction. And it's to be like these, this. yeah, these science fiction and philosophical issues of life, and I think I think where you were born, the kind of um, the experiences of being uh, an Eastern European nation, you know, that has had that constant ebb and flow of empire, and uh, <laughs> how do you maintain a local national identity as opposed to the invading forces? all those philosophical questions suddenly sort of come together in a new way, thinking about a new future through science fiction. Um, mm. Just before I ask you the question about science fiction, um, I'm going to ask Max. Max, you as an engineer, do you see the world of engineering as sort of like science fiction coming true? In a sense, um science fiction has looked into the future and predicted what technology might catch up with in due course. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, the virtual reality thing translates into the brain a little bit, I think. Okay. And that brings us to the virtual reality thing. And uh, really that's <laughs> what we want to talk about, uh, Demi, is, what do you understand by these terms VR and and AR? Well, uh, to put it simply, I mean, uh, virtual reality, well, let's, let's start with AR, which is augmented reality. Augmented reality 
is uh, is a tool that actually enhances our reality let's say uh, it doesn't transport you or anything else into uh, a new space basically using a technology to enhance the the world around you let's say holographic screens around you or uh, a projected uh, um, interactive uh, keyboard on the table and then you, you can touch so that's augmented reality uh, but where virtual reality is, uh, is a reality that diverts you as a person from the reality. It, trans it transcends you into a virtual world and you experience it as a digital ID, I would say it, you know. So uh, that's, that's the difference between the two of them. Uh, and uh, while virtual reality is very good for content, and uh, what Max was saying, uh, translating uh, some of the uh, things, uh, let's say, engineering in, in uh, even uh, in um, uh, medical fields, uh, uh, in uh, technology, in uh, in um, let's say uh, companies to um, basically uh, promote their products. What, the other side augmented reality it only enhances the real thing uh, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't uh, give you that 360 view of the world you can turn around in in virtual reality you can turn around and you're still in that virtual space in augmented reality it's a little bit different so um still augmented reality is a little bit more gimmicky than virtual reality yeah, um, virtual reality is, as far as I can work out, taking us to a place of the imagination. Uh, and that is the most human thing, isn't it? To, to be able to imagine something, to give that imaginative insight some shape. And that's what I think the movie maker is doing. Now, I'm going to bring up Stuart McAdams' first question in a minute, but he's actually put a second question in, Demi, that uh, uh, I, it just goes back to a, a point just before we began talking about virtual reality, and it's a really good point. S Stuart says, mm. some of the finest movies ever made are by filmmakers who are not well yet well known. Any comments about that? <laughs> uh, I guess I don't. I don't. I don't know the real reason, but from my point of view, kind of little speculative point of view, I would say because they can risk a lot more, they don't have much to lose as the established filmmaker. That said, maybe it's because of that kind of uh, um, ability. Again, to 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 risk to take that leap of faith without being concerned of uh, of what that's gonna do to their reputation of what they've done before before that point. Maybe that's the answer. Maybe that's not. But um, I guess they're just uh, risk takers. Uh, full stop uh, is the same with uh, the biggest uh, wealthiest entrepreneurs in this world not only the filmmakers those are the biggest risk takers who are willing to risk the most but they know their field and they inform very well about that field so they take very informative very calculative risks just above the normal threshold what's normal to risk at that point so they gain a lot more after that so i guess that kind of hopefully answers that question yeah i, I think it does i think it's a great question we may come back to that uh, a little bit later stuart but in having answered that uh stuart's feeding these questions in and i really like that so i'm just selecting his next one and uh this one says uh, maybe, <laughs> how do you think virtual reality will change the dynamic of human relationships? Well, it will have both negative and positive impact. I mean, anything we experience as human beings has that result. It will have a positive impact on relationships which have a positive intentions or positive environment on positive 
positive, uh, um, uh, how do you say it, like a, a yeah, environment around them, uh, positive charge. Uh, the, it will have a positive effect on that, on human relationships. I mean, there is an interesting, uh, interesting uh, thing about that. Also, it can have a negative uh, impact of withdrawing ourselves from each other, like sitting on the same table, uh, talking to each other through the tablet or the mobile phone. Uh, and uh, that can kind of uh, cost a little bit withdraw withdrawal and um, impersonal becomes uh, impersonal and it's been happening for a while and that's why uh, for a, for a, uh, for a while that's been suggested that games are responsible for some shootings let's say happen in America or games are responsible for uh, um, for this and that um, but um, on the end of the day it will have both it will have a positive negative impact like anything else technology will always have both impacts is that balance of how that technology has been used it's the question how to keep that balance so the negative is not outweighing the positive that's a great answer and i'm just going to bring up the uh um background to our questions here and when you say that it's the balance of how you use these things sometimes they can be used positively sometimes negatively i'd just like to flick the same question to max do you think virtual reality will change human relationships max uh, yes i do and, and unfortunately a negative aspect comes to mind first because of what we've just discussed and that is it improves or increases the ability to indoctrinate and that's a little bit scary. But on the positive side, um, look at what people are achieving through Skype when they have grandchildren at the other end of the world. Now, to be able to use virtual reality to communicate and relate within the family or, or with friends, that has tremendous potential for uh, enhancing the dynamic of human relationships, I believe. Um, if I can cut in uh, uh, on that note, I mean, there is, there is like Max and uh, saying, uh, there's a lot of positive and negative about it. Um, uh, I'm, I, I kind of uh, uh, believe that uh, concentrating on the positives uh, uh, a lot more can actually improve or neutralize some of the negatives as well. So um, let's say I, I watched another TED, TED talk and there was a filmmaker who was doing 360 virtual reality films and he made one about about a, um, a girl and a family somewhere in, in a third world country. I forgot which one it was. I think it was um, Syria. But, um, Syria, yes. And uh, that's the, the TED talk you watched, I guess. And he, he, um, he sent it to uh, some of the heads of the UN uh, or EU and uh, it changed their mind on uh, quite a few things uh, by watching that virtual reality 360 video of them basically being sitting in that room where the, that family lives and being able to to uh, sit in front of opposite that girl. So it, in that aspect, um, I can see I can see now going back to your first, uh, one of your first questions about how that can um, you know transcend into um, into theology or to uh, the churches and the, to to the congregation that can be another aspect of actually uh, interacting with uh, uh, within within the congregation uh, using virtual reality. So I don't know. It's interesting, but I definitely like the the positives a lot more than the negatives. Uh, so it's just a state of mind, I guess. One of the things that, uh, again, in terms of preparing for this talk, Demi sent me the, or put on Facebook, I think it was, whatever, the link to a TED talk. And I've embedded that on Demi's Kiwi Connection page as well, so that our folk can go back and look at that link, uh, I hope, a number of times. Because I thought, Demi, that it was the most inspirational thing that I've ever seen. Uh, we could talk about virtual reality till the cows come home. 
But what this movie <laughs> did was this very talented technological filmmaker with the most amazing camera that captured not only 360 up and above and below and around uh, in terms of visual, it also had the um, uh, microphones to, to pick up the 360 degree the sound, sounds. Yeah. Um, and when you look at it, as it spread out a little bit like a, a, a map of the globe spread out on a yeah. on a book of an atlas yeah um, you, you can't possibly comprehend but what he did he shot the movie inside um, the life in a Syrian refugee camp it may not have been in Syria it might, might have been on one of the adjacent country borders possibly Turkey I, I don't recall but then having made the film he took it to the united nations probably to a group like unesco or, or whatever and showed it to the people who are influencers who shape opinions and they put on their um uh i don't know whether you call them vr masks or, yeah. or the goggles or, or whatever and they came out utterly transformed because they said they experienced the reality of what it was like for a nine-year-old refugee in a way that the flat image couldn't possibly convey yeah. and in that sense i think that virtual reality is a powerful tool as Dimi rightly says for churches and humanitarian groups that want to make a difference um, yeah. It's probably the single most important tool that the churches could possibly use. I, I don't mean by that that they will use them because they still use the technologies of 2,000 years ago, <laughs> which may or may not um, necessarily be all that enlightening and today. But if, it, if any kind of humanitarian group, any group that had compassion for the plight mm. of another, um, started to use this method, I think it does have the capacity to change human relationships. Stuart I, uh, McAdam, I've done answering that question. And we've got a new question coming for you, uh, Demi. It's from a guy called Stuart Mannins, who's a regular contributor here on uh, Live On Air. He often sits with me or argues with me in this seat as well. So I'm just going to select <laughs> Stuart's question. And uh, what Stuart is asking, and it's directed to you, Demi, is I recall an idea previously used about poetry, the willing suspension of disbelief. How does this relate to <laughs> augmented and virtual reality? Over, over to you, you're the expert. Uh, the willing suspension <laughs> of disbelief. Well, um, uh, I guess it comes it comes down to uh, our own perception of what we want to accept and what we don't want to accept um, as, uh, as what is reality or what it's not. So uh, I'm not a big expert on uh, willing, uh, on willing conception of disbelief, and I have to research it a little bit more myself but uh, um, I, I'm, I'm not really an expert to answer it in, uh, more in a detail than um, uh, I already did with the, what I think about virtual reality is. Maybe if, uh, if it's a little bit more uh, direct or more specific question. Okay, I'll, I'll do the sort of translation of that question. What, what I think Stuart is getting at, every time that we go to, into a movie theater, or into uh, a play for live drama, um, or even into a, a rock concert or a classical music concert, doesn't matter. Wherever there's performance going on, we, we have to suspend some of our normal beliefs in order that we can get into and empathize uh, with what's going on either on screen, on stage, or uh, in our ears. So uh, I think what he's meaning um, is, yeah, that, that if we're willing to do this, virtual reality will be really important. I, I see that as a, only a small subset 
of virtual reality. I think virtual reality yeah. is there whether you suspend your disbelief or not. Uh, when you put those goggles on, yeah. you are in that virtual reality and you don't have to suspend disbelief. It's there. It's real. So I, I understand, I think, what Stuart's saying, but it's a subset of virtual reality. Yeah, I think uh, I think it becomes instead of a, a reason to do it, it is already being kind of checked. You know, you already you already tick that uh, that box before you even before you even uh, get into that moment. So, uh, in terms of uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, uh, that that uh, um, conscious decision to disconnect or to escape or to immerse yourself is probably a step or two before the, the moment you already start using uh, the virtual reality because um, it, it becomes it becomes as a given uh, in well, the, well in it's, the, it's uh, a little bit like even before uh, before I go to the movie I'm willing to buy my ticket <laughs> yeah. and therefore I'm, I'm willing to enter the movie maker's world, aren't I? So yeah. the kinds of normal beliefs I have, are, 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 they're not put aside, but then they're, they're not the prime reason that I'm there. I want to enter uh, the world of the documentary that Demi made. I, I want to enter the world of uh, the one about the psych, the psychologist, um, <laughs> the various movies. So as soon as I buy the ticket, I've already committed myself to uh, entering another's space. But you've committed yourself to an ent entertainment of the space. It's mm. not, again, it's a subset. Oh, well, I, I don't actually agree with that, Max. What I think is that what is sometimes called entertainment is just another way of talking about realities that are in the mind and the imagination. And in fact, it may be entertainment. This may be what Stuart's getting at. It may be mm. so-called entertainment that actually gives yeah. me the most powerful reasons for living. What, what do you think of that, Dimi? Well, um, uh, we know that uh, that entertainment is uh, it's kind of a escapism medium to a certain extent, right? So um, uh, we go to the movies uh, to to be entertained, to be taken into a different world, to to learn something new. Uh, so I absolutely agree with you with you and um, uh, and with Stuart that uh, that willing willing uh, uh, you know willingly uh, immersing or giving giving up the reality or putting the reality behind or on a second seat is something that um, we, we we need as or we we kind of cling to as a, as a species you know we, we are very demanding and complex uh, beings that we have needs psychologically physically and uh, and uh, we all have some some kind of uh, our own baggages and our own beliefs and our own demons uh, or anything that we kind of we battle that uh, we have a lot of those battles within our minds constantly every day and um, finding finding that kind of uh, um, disconnecting from the real world giving giving our mind a break a little bit to to basically not being so engaged with our day to day uh, troubles or commitments, it, it, it kind of it, it's it's relaxing and um, and uh, and quite uh, quite uh, beneficial in some ways. I would say that's why it's so powerful. Media has been a powerful ally to to governments to uh, you know uh, to companies to markets to uh, filmmakers so yeah it is uh, quite an interesting concept yeah i think it's actually one of the key concepts uh that uh, we all deal with because the the church reality has always been that it's dealt with the what we call the mythos mm. and the logos so the mythos uh, is that mythological basis out of which we we 
generate a huge number of images um like the force be with you is not a hang of a lot different from <laughs> a certain christian and uh, buddhist and hindu affirmations but also we deal in in church terms we also deal with what you've just been describing which we would call logos and logos mm. is that kind of rationality uh that that's the rationality that I think Stuart is saying has to be suspended in order to enter the movie maker's craft. Mm -hmm. um, Demi, I'm just going to bring up the question sheet for the last time. Just bear with me while I find it and highlight it. While you're doing that, David, can I just make the point that I think you're talking about virtual unreality. If you're using the technology as a mechanism for communication and uh, this could apply in the church situation and certainly to the distant communication you're bringing the reality of what is a long way away to mm. the near so there are yeah. there are the two aspects of virtual reality mm. we don't need to focus just on the virtual unreality yeah yeah <laughs> it is it is very complex uh, uh setting in uh, um there is a lot of possibilities of how things can go from here but um the way i see it it's uh, that technological capabilities and the technology that serves those tools will keep improving and giving us more comprehensive and user-friendly and uh engaging uh um aspects of what virtual reality and augmented reality will be within the next 10 years let's say is it's just it's mind-blowing what will be happening in the next 20 years i i think you're absolutely right there and uh, i i think the distinction between what max calls reality and unreality will become ever more blurry but um I'd like yep. to start to draw this to a close. I love the curtain flapping across, mm -hmm. Demi. That my cat often walks across and its tail appears magically in our <laughs> live on air <laughs> broadcast. I'm just going to close I'd like it off. to sort of bring us to a kind of uh, the final question. You've been working on the Ara movie, and I've got that highlighted here on the screen share. People can. If you go to your Facebook and type in uh, Demi Nakoff and <laughs> you, you'll you'll end up and you'll be able to get the trailer and bits and pieces about our movie. You'll also get the most uh, interesting biographical details about Demi uh, and his work. That's a lovely little bio movie that you've got there. Uh, absolutely fantastic. But I would like you to tell us what is this movie ara about and what's what's driving you in it um well the film is uh is kind of a multi-layered uh uh science fiction uh, but um it, it kind of it tells the story of uh artificial ai uh uh, software called Aura that wants to know and experience what it is to be human. Uh, at the same time, uh, it it uh, it to talks it tells the story about a young girl, Sam Samara, called Sam, that is in a coma and she wants to wake up and be back with her family. It tells the story about her father, that is a biotech engineer in a corporation that wants to. Ex, uh, to uh, exploit um, Ara's capabilities to transform, trans, uh, trans, uh, transform our, our, um, um, memories and consciousness from one body to another, and and uh, also it is about the corporation and its uh, uh, its identity and what it stands for. It is about uh, the 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 world uh, in, which could happen to be, uh, let's say, in the next 20, 30 years. So it, it is very, very uh, has a thought-provoking um, uh, philosophical aspect uh, into the whole film. It, it doesn't have uh, the the big action sequences. It, it mostly 
uh, asks questions in a very um, very um, non uh, pushy way uh, for the audience to think about and when they leave or they once they watch the film when it's completed to to ask themselves uh, uh, what we want to do for our future how do we see uh, to to be, to be more engaged with each other and think about the big picture not only think about me as an individual but think about my family think about this town think about the whole global uh, community and um, i think i think uh, that's the main message is uh, bring that global connection uh, uh, and uh, i i would love to see that kind of uh, for um, for uh, uh, us to be more connected with each other not in with the te with technology as a as a tool but be connected here uh, instead of through the electronic uh, pathways um, Max, do you have any comments about uh, the film uh, as Demi's explained it? Because that's one of your concerns, isn't it? That uh, all all the kinds of technology that we're now accumulating today could in fact be used to uh, manipulate us, to make us less human rather than more human. Any comments well, about that? Compliant. Yes, I, I guess... Um, <laughs> What occurs to me is what has happened with cell phones in the last decade or so. Are we going to see the same advancement of virtual reality such that everyone is participating in it as they do now and sit with cell phones? Um, again, I guess it's back to the how humans use it as to whether it gets bad use in indoctrination or what I'd call good use of indoctrination as in the TED program, where they brought the reality through to the United Nations staff. Any, <coughs> pardon me, any comments on that, Demi? Um, uh, just uh, uh, Maxwell mentioned that, and um, uh, I, 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 as much as I see a lot of positive, I, I see um, along the side of the cell phone uh, angle, uh, Max was saying, is that um, uh, right now there is a boom of uh, kind of uh, virtual reality rooms or uh, spaces where you have two, five, 20, 50 people or more sitting with the headsets, with the, with the headphones, experiencing the movie on totally isolated way um, uh, that uh, in a theater you're sitting with people next to you they eat popcorn you want to slap somebody in the head or whatever or a kid is crying or or uh, or two teenagers are pushing each other and you want them to go away it, it, it kind of uh, isolates all of this kind of interactive way of how we experience cinema and makes it more even more closed off into a little kind of a dome vacuum type of thing that will be that being said this is just part of the growth uh, pathway of where this technology will go where i see it this as now as a being kind of a disadvantage in due time where the virtual reality be, brings that interactiveness back you know you're already sitting to somebody else you can turn around you can see them you don't see the headset because you're in virtual reality watching a movie and you can even zoom in or or or, uh, or or do some other commands that the movie makers enabled you to do during the watch of that movie without extending the duration of the movie because some people mind up watching it for five hours instead of for an hour and a half. So while this is uh, now being kind of a setback where the technology moves to that point that multiple headsets in a cinema can bring us to the point that we are back in the cinema the way it used to be but we are in a virtual reality cinema instead sitting in a real cinema being in a virtual reality cinema being still in that interactive but even more interactive uh way than it used to be almost kind of um, creating a virtual reality within that reality, adding the augmented reality into that. So it's it's kind of a hybrid, uh, kind of a chimera happening there at some point. 
That's a, that's a really neat explanation, in my opinion. <laughs> and it kind of ties in. Stuart McAdam has sent through another question. <clears throat> um, good on you, Stuart. Um, we're really putting Dimmy on the spot here. Uh, <laughs> he, he's really making a comment here rather than a question, but he says he thinks that virtual reality should be used to assist us in life rather than drive us. And uh, oh, I absolutely. see... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I I see Dimmy nodding his head. Max, that's a question that perhaps you would like to say something about. I, I would certainly identify with that. That yes, it's got the potential for for both. We need to use it to assist us, which we certainly can. And I think again in the TED program there was an example of a researcher looking inside very small spaces mm. and using the virtual reality technology there, um, and. We need to, as a human race, be careful that virtual reality isn't used in a badly negative way. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that's that's absolutely correct. I'm aware that we've come pretty well to 7.45. That's slightly longer than we normally take, Demi. So that's an indication of uh, the interest, I think, that there is in this particular subject. And I hope that there's building an interest also in you and the ARA film. And uh, one of the things that I'd like to do is to be able at some point in the future, will that be a downloadable film that, uh, you know, I can pay whatever the fee is, download it and show it? Can I show it to my uh, friends at the local church? Oh, definitely. Uh, the movie, like any other product, it will have uh, a, a number of uh, release win windows, which means different formats and once the movie is completed we'll formulate uh, or lock down that kind of a formula or strategy and it will end up being ultimately on a digital platforms like mobile phones or or uh, tablets that will be able to be downloaded shared um, I'm thinking of uh, going as far as far as uh, creating a virtual reality uh, kind of uh, experience which will tap into the uh, 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 transferring or uh, storing uh, consciousness and memories uh, into a into hard drive and um, kind of looking into our minds and how memories are working, how our minds are working. So, I'm looking into that um, to kind of partner with a vi virtual reality, augmented reality companies to to bring that um, that kind of uh, scientific approach research that will kind of um, the audience uh, or people who are interested about that side of things can experience in a virtual reality side of things. Well, actually, that's a fascinating thing. And now we could now spend the next two or three hours actually discussing <laughs> that particular topic. Yeah. Because I believe that <laughs> memory is not stored in the human brain. <laughs> uh, I, I believe that memory is a field. And I've used the work of Rupert Sheldrake, and I highly recommend Sheldrake's work to anyone, but particularly it might be useful to you, Demi, because what he's saying is that uh, effectively our brain, um, which is not to be identified with our mind, but our brain is basically more like a receiver that picks up fields of memory that are stored throughout the universe. From, from a Christian perspective, <clears throat> uh, if I can put my God hat on for a moment, this is this is this is what God is saying. <laughs> uh, that perhaps the voice of God, perhaps the mind of God, is in fact the ability to be able to feel with the heart in the field of stored morphic resonance. Those are the memories of the universe. And St. Augustine had a wonderful phrase. This is a project that I'm working on. So <laughs> your answer really has kind of stimulated me to say this. St. Augustine uh, in the fourth century had a wonderful phrase called windows in the walls of time. And why I am so enthusiastic about the movie making process and all the amplifications uh, or the ability to put VR into it, etc., is that these uh, become 
windows into the walls of time. So you're absolutely right. In 17, 20 mm. years' time, we will look back and we'll say, why were they having that discussion about virtual reality? Didn't they see the obvious? You know, it was sitting in front of them all the time, but they just ignored it, fell over it, stumbled and And, and I think that's how humans um, move on. Well, I'd, I'd better draw it to a close. Um, Dimmy, it's been an absolute delight. I want to thank you very much indeed. I want to thank Max for coming along and sitting here, and uh, especially Stuart McAdam out there uh, feeding in questions for us. That's been uh, very helpful. Thank you, Stuart. <laughs> so um, just keep us uh, posted, and maybe at some time in the near future, next six months or eight months, you'd like to come back in and tell us how ARA is getting on or whether it's because uh, it's in the post-production phase now, isn't it? Yeah, 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 we, we, we are in post. Uh, it's quite a long, long road ahead of us, but um, um, I guess it's, it's just uh, one of those things uh, that uh, it's a challenge that I'm, I'm more than willing to and I'd love that to take on board so far, so I can't wait to to get it done so everybody can see it. But uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Max and uh, uh, Stuart for the questions. And uh, like you said, we could have talked for another two, three hours uh, minimum because there's so much to discuss. I mean, we can go into the artificial intelligence from here and, and circle back to the augmented reality, virtual reality, sci-fi, you know, documentaries, you know, all those things. So it's it's just the world is full of potential and and positivity and capabilities and possibilities that we can only kind of grasp or see if we stop thinking and listen sometimes. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful note to end on. Thank you very much indeed and we look forward to the next time. Thank you so much.